Good morning. Uh, welcome to our gathering here at Southside Baptist Church. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, if you're a guest with us, we're happy to have you this morning. Um, we're gathered here this morning to worship God, the one um, who sent his son, Jesus, to rescue us from our sins. And that's what it's all about here this morning. Um, if you didn't get a um, worship guide in the back, you can pick one right there at the entrance. Um, one guest we have this morning is Jeff Maxey and his wife, Evie. Um, they're here with us this morning, so he'll be leading us in the Word this morning with the message. Um, he grew up originally from Louisville, Kentucky, um, and he went to Southern Seminary. Um, and then from there, he was at Eastwood Baptist Church for about 12 years um, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And then from there, he had a change of plans and went back and got his master's in teaching um, before joining the International Mission Board. Um, and then he was with IMB for about a decade um, in um, North Africa in that area. Um, but currently, he's um, an elder at Renewal Church in Anderson. Um, and he's also a special education teacher um, in uh, one of the Anderson school districts, right? So, school District 3. And some of you teachers may recognize him because he was uh, 2019 South Carolina Teacher of the Year. So um, some of you all may recognize him here. Um, so this morning, I'm going to um, read some scripture, open us up, and then we'll pray, and then Jeff can come up. Um, so we want God's word to lead us this morning um, to worship him. So I'm going to be reading from Colossians. Colossians 3, um, starting in verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for this time here this morning. We just pray for your presence over us. And um, we just thank you for who you are and just your mercy and grace that you give us each day. Um, and we just pray for those who are um, facing sickness or uncertainties, even both. Um, we just pray, talking about peace right there. Um, we just pray for your peace and comfort um, with them. And um, I just pray for Jeff this morning um, as he uh, leads us in a message. And we just um, um, pray for your voice through him. And um, we just pray for your presence over this service this morning. Um, and we thank you for the love that you always give us. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you uh, today. Uh, excited about the opportunity to be at Southside. Now, as you heard, I'm a school teacher by trade, and so therefore, before I came, I, I pointed somebody, you don't know who they are in the congregation, that's going to write down anybody that misbehaves while the pastor's gone. So if that's you, and you have a tendency to either sleep or misbehave, somebody's going to take your name down and turn it in. I also did a little bit of research before coming today about Southside Baptist Church. And you may or may not know this, but Southside Baptist Church has a reputation. Southside has a reputation to be a church that's on mission. A church that's on mission here in Abbeville. A church that has partnerships around our country and around our world. Um, because Abbeville Baptist Church, or Southside Baptist Church in Abbeville uh, believes in taking the gospel to those who have not heard. So I hope that today's message is an encouragement to you. Uh, and what you're already doing, and how God is already using you as a church uh, family uh, to impact for the kingdom around the world. Today we're going to be in Psalm 96, and we're going to be looking at singing a new song, a message of mission. Psalm 96, I'll read it for us. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory 
and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, for the truths that it holds for us and a message that you have for us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will anoint this time that we spend together, that your word would be exalted and your name proclaimed and praised among your people today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I know that you've heard messages from missionaries before, (laughs) a message of what God is doing uh, around the world. And sometimes when we approach mission, sometimes a mission message, say that twice, mission message, mission message can come across as kind of being heavy with guilt. If I could lay it heavy enough on you today, I could convince you to write a check for mission, or maybe convince you to go on a short-term trip, or maybe even a weak moment, if you didn't get a good night's rest last night, to sign up for a long-term missions experience. But that's not what really God's Word is doing for us. Uh, today. Also, when we think about missions, sometimes if we're not careful, we can approach it from an angle as if we're trying to rescue God as if he's losing, to save him from embarrassment, um, but as if we're the heroes in the story. But we know that in God's word, there's only one hero, and that's the creator of all things who gave his son. And so missions is not rescuing God or saving him from embarrassment. But at the same time, we have to be honest about the size of the task before us. As we gather here today, there are 2 billion people around the world who are unreached. Now, that's not unsaved. That's unreached. Those are people that do not have access to the gospel of Christ. 2 billion people that don't have an indigenous church uh, where they can worship. Two billion people that don't even have a copy of God's word in their own language so that they could access the good news. American Bible Society tells us that there are 900 English translations of the Bible. If we went through our homes, we could probably find and count lots of different versions of the Bible. 900 English versions, yet there are 6,000 people groups in the world that don't even have John 3.16 translated for them yet in their heart language. If we threw a dart at a map and we just hit any geographical area, we could compare North Yemen, which is 8 million people, that's one and a half size, times the size of South Carolina. 8 million people, no access yet to the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the task is large. And so as we think about it, then if those are the things that mission is not, it's not going to be guilt, it's not rescuing God, then what is missions? What's our foundation as we approach the scripture uh, this morning? I was given a book in seminary by John Piper called Let the Nations Be Glad. And this quote about missions has stuck with me. And I want you to think about it this morning. Piper says, missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. Because worship is what will continue and stay. Now you heard that I served in North Africa for almost 10 years uh, in an Islamic setting, uh, Arabic speaking setting. Now before uh, I went overseas, I was single when I went overseas, I was a youth minister. And during the 20s as a youth minister, I ate a lot of fast food. It seemed like it was a lot, you know, that was just kind of what you did. You ate a lot of fast food. And then someday it dawned on me, you know, I should probably eat a little healthier. So going through the drive-thru, 
I started not saying, don't put the tomato on the hamburger. I thought if they left the tomato on there, I would get, I don't like tomatoes, but I thought that would be one step toward healthiness. Now, I, per, I proceeded from that, and I began to learn how to cook a little bit. I hit my 30s as a single, and I thought, okay, I need to learn how to cook a little bit more, and so I learned, and I figured you go to the Ingalls, and you buy cans of this, and boxes of this, and bags of this, you mix them together in the right proportions, put them in the oven at 350 degrees, always 350 degrees, you put it in the oven, and depending on the sugar content of what you put in the oven, you either were going to have a cake or a casserole when it came out. And so I learned how to cook and sort of prided myself on cooking. But when I went moved to North Africa, there was no grocery store. And there were no cans and bags and boxes for me to mix in those right proportions in order to make the things that I wanted to make. And so for the first months of living in North Africa, I ate a lot of sandwiches and a lot of eggs because those were things I could figure out how to cook. Now, Islamic people were extremely hospitable, but during those first months when I got there, all I could say was, Smiti Jeff, my name is Jeff, and I could count to 10. But that wasn't great conversation for dinner, so nobody ever invited me over, because they didn't want to hear 1 to 10 and me repeat my name multiple times. Um, so then I had to figure out, um, what am I going to eat? Well, I had this epiphany one day. I had this epiphany that my grandmothers were very good cooks. And they didn't necessarily grow up with all those cans and boxes and bags of things to mix up. They had raw ingredients that they turned into good meals. And so I had something my grandmothers didn't have. I had the Google. And the Google, on days that the internet works, could show me recipes of all kinds of things that I could make. So I started experimenting uh, with all the different things that I could make. And all of a sudden, it transformed the way that I could walk through the market. The market before, it used to be all these foods that I didn't know what to do with because it was all raw ingredients. Now, as I walked through the market, I could see tomatoes and onions and spices. And in my brain, I could say, spaghetti sauce. And I could walk through the market, and I could see the chickens. Now, they were still alive with the feathers on them, but I could imagine what they might look like if somebody would kill it and take the feathers off. All the things that I could do with chicken. And as I started walking through the market, a place that I considered uh, with all this food that I could not access, all of a sudden was now abounding in food options. Well, I had another realization, this one more spiritual, um, is the longer I lived there. Though I would have never said it out loud, sometimes I think I took the idea of missions that I was somehow taking God someplace where he was not already at as if the place that I was going was dark, and it was very, very dark. But it was dark because God was not there. Even in our vernacular, we use the phrase God forsaken, as if God is not in a particular place. But I had this realization that God was already there. And the place was dark because there was no worship of God in that place. It was dark because people did not know the good news of Jesus Christ. And as I began to work through that with the Lord, I began to see God everywhere I looked, just like I saw the food. In the desert of in the Sahara Desert, you can drive without seeing anything for the longest, longest time. Sand and rocks is all you can see for hours. But then you can see a little green blip over on the side. And if you pull your truck over and hike out to that little green blip, you'll see the little green blip goes down and it becomes this little, it becomes a valley. And at the bottom of that valley is a bubbling brook, and there's palm trees and green. And that oasis in the middle of the desert, which you would have completely missed if you hadn't seen that little green dot over there and wanted to go investigate and see what it was. And I could see God in that place, and I could see the living water that God springs up in our dry and, and barren lives. In Islamic culture, there's lots of, lots of animal sacrifice. They sacrifice rams and goats and, and sheep for different holidays. Uh, sacrifice camels uh, for weddings, and so there's lots of blood, and all of a sudden the Old Testament stories of animal sacrifice, and then the blood of Christ came real to me when I saw all this uh, taking place in front of me. And even when I was walking and trying with my broken Arabic to have conversations, I'd be reminded of the story of Tower of Babel when man wanted to be more like God and thought he could be like God, and God gave us all these languages that twisted our tongues to make communication more difficult. 
and I realized that, that God was there all along. And my favorite phrase in Arabic with my friends became, ah, which means, oh, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> because with all my, my Muslim friends, I would, oh, there's a bubbling brook. That reminds me of a story of the living water of Christ. Or, oh, there's a, a, all this weird Arabic, and you don't understand what I'm saying because my Arabic doesn't sound like real Arabic. That reminds me of a story of when man thought, it could, man thought he could be like God. And so if we think about missions this morning, as we look at Psalm 96, we're not, missions is not taking God someplace where he isn't already, but missions is sharing the good news in a place where he's not yet worshipped, whether that's on the other side of our town or on the other side of the globe. So let's look at Psalm 96 together. Psalm 96 is an excerpt from 1 Chronicles 16, almost in its entirety if you compare the two. Psalm 96 was written as a song for when the ark was brought into the tabernacle or the tent that David had built in Jerusalem. And he would speak of throughout the Psalms. Psalm 96 was sung for the first time by Asaph and his brothers. And Psalm 96 is a picture of worship. But note as we go through it, not just worship for the Israelites, but worship for the nations. And the nations in that sense means you and me, that we as Gentiles have access to this God. So let's look at the beginning of Psalm 96 verses 1 to 6. Psalm 96, 1 to 6 shows us missions as worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day and declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 96 begins. That phrase, new song, appears in Scripture nine times. Five times it's in the psalm and one time in Isaiah in songs like this one. Five of the times it's an admonition or a command to us to sing a song, sing a new song. And then in Psalm 40, the psalmist proclaims, he he put a new song in my mouth. The other two times that the phrase new song is mentioned in Scripture comes in the book of Revelation. First in Revelation 5 and then in Revelation 7. Revelation 5, John is weeping loudly because no one could be found to open the scroll that had the seven seals. But then, then the Lamb came to take the scroll. And in Revelation 5, verse 9, John records for us, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now don't miss it. Don't miss it. Who was the blood slain? Who was the lamb slain for? Who was the blood for? It was for every tribe and language and people and nation. And then in Revelation 7, I love this. Watch this in Revelation 7. John says in verse 9, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You know, in our lives, we don't always get to see how the story ends. But here in Revelation, we see how the story ends. In Revelation 5, we see who was Christ slain for. He was slain for every tribe, language, people, and nation. And then in chapter 7, we see the end. Who was gathered around the throne? Every tribe and language and people and nation. They had heard the good news. They had received the salvation. And they got, we get to see a picture of the end. Now, you may have gone on a short-term mission trip where you planted seeds. You may have given a gift 
to one of your partnership uh, missionaries. You may have given a gift to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. You may have spoken to somebody in line in Ingalls and told them the good news, and you don't know how that story ended. You don't know how that money got used. You don't know how the seeds that you planted on that short-term trip uh, panned out in the end. But we get a picture here of the end. As a youth minister, I took students one year uh, to Puerto Rico where we were rebuilding homes after a hurricane. And so the week we were there, we put down the foundation and they did the, uh, the walls and put on the roof. And the family that we were working with, the Perezas, um, they had two young daughters and uh, we would speak to them in Spanish and through a translator. Um, we would share the good news with them. They were not believers. Um, and so we came back home like a lot of short-term trips and you you pray for them, but you don't really know whatever happened to them. Well, in this particular case, about 10 years later, I got invited back to Puerto Rico to be a pastor at a youth, youth camp for a summer. And it was in the same region of the country, or the same region of the, the territory. And so one day after we were doing our work, I told the person I was driving with, I said, I want to go see if I can find that house that we worked on way back when. I want to see if it's still standing. <laughs> Number one, you sometimes wonder if the house is still standing when a bunch of teenagers go and build a house, right? And so... We went by, and sure enough, the house was still there. It looked gorgeous. There were plants on the front porch and the whole thing. I thought, let's knock on the door and see if the same people live there. So we went out, we knocked on the door, and sure enough, I recognized them. They recognized me, surprisingly. Uh, we sat down. We were having a conversation the best I could in broken Spanish. And, uh, and then I asked, I said, now, where are your two daughters at? Because they were little when we were there the first time. And they said, oh, you haven't seen them? Said, How would I have seen them? They said, oh. And they began to tell me their story. After our team had left and other teams had been there to visit with them, the whole family had come to know Christ, were baptized, were part of a church. And that week that I was there preaching a, a church youth camp, their kids were at the camp giving back so that others might see. And I got to see a bit of a picture of how the story ended. But who knows how, many, how the stories end most of the time when we plant the seeds, when we're obedient. Uh, to what God wants us to do. We don't always get to see the end, but John gives us a picture here. And so the psalmist calls us to sing a new song. What's this new song about? The psalmist tells us, tell of his salvation from day to day. Where? Among the nations. To who? All peoples. Why? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And that's a message for us. Tomorrow, when we're on mission for him, whether that's at work or at school, with our families or in line at the store, what are we to say? Tell of his salvation from day to day. Why? For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And we see this new song, a new song for new believers as they experience light when they've only known darkness when they taste living water, when their mouths have always been parched and dry. And it's a new song that we experience in worship because missions is an act of worship. The second thing I want us to see in the psalm comes in verses 7 to 10 is we see missions as obedience. The psalmist writes, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to, the Lord, do, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the people with equity. The psalmist writes, ascribe. Ascribe means give credit to you're writing a paper at school, you put down footnotes or endnotes to give credit to whoever had that original uh, thought or idea. And in this case, who had the original thought? Who do we give all the glory and the credit to? We give all the glory and the credit uh, to the Lord. As we think about missions, uh, it's not about us as humans and man and what we can do, but it's about what God is doing and uh, can do through us. And again, we're given the command to say among the nations, that the Lord reigns. There's a command to go. I think of Jesus' last words in the book of Matthew when he tells us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. 
are the last recorded words before Jesus ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, when he, when he says to the people, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it's a picture and a command to go. Missions is a going uh, action. And we see the picture. Where do we go to? Well, Jerusalem is, are those that are nearest to us, the people that are the same culture that we are, speak the same language, eat the same foods, have the same likes and dislikes, and they live close by. Those are the people in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our community that we take the good news to and we're commanded to take the gospel. But Jesus didn't leave it there. He didn't say just take the gospel to the people that are closest to you. He said take the gospel to Judea. And Judea are those that have the same culture that we do, the same language, the same uh, belief system. They understand what's around them, um, but they're a little further away. That would be our North American missions that we support, and missionaries uh, like the church family in Boston that you support and have a partnership with there. Same culture, same language. You don't have to have a passport, but you do have to go travel and share the good news uh, there. But not just there. Jesus didn't leave it there. And I think he ruffled some feathers here when he said, you got to go to Samaria as well. Now, where's, where's Samaria? Samaria was right next door. It was right close to them. They didn't have to go very far to get to Samaria at all, but they didn't want to go to Samaria. Nobody liked Samaria. They would walk way out of the way to avoid Samaria. Nobody wanted to go to the Samaritans. Jesus told the, the parable, the good Samaritan, to get the, church, the religious leader's attention, didn't he? And so Samaria are those people that they're close by, but they, they're not like us. They don't look like us. They might not have the same language as us. They might, might not believe some of the same things that we believe. But God, Jesus gives us the command, the gospel. His blood was shed for the Samaritans. And we take the gospel to the Samaritans. And then he said, and to the end of the earth. End of the earth are those who are uh, different culture, different language, eat different foods, and they're far away. Uh, as well, that we take the good news to that. Pretty much he covers all peoples in that command, didn't he? Nobody's out. He didn't say, take it to all of these people, but leave these people out. We don't like them. No, the good news was for all. We have a command to go, but we also have a command to pray. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus, Matthew writes to us, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There's a command to go, but there's also a command to pray. And then there's a command to give. Verse 8 of the psalm tells us to bring an offering and come into his court. We give that offering so that all might know the good news of Christ. And it's the church's responsibility to send. As we gather now, there's over 3,500 uh, Southern Baptist missionaries through the International Mission Board serving as Southside's missionaries around the world. Over 5,000 North American Mission Board missionaries uh, serving within North America and 3,500 chaplains serving as well, all representing Southside Baptist Church and all other churches of the cooperative program that, that send the missionaries on our behalf. And so we get to Romans 10 where Paul asks some very difficult questions. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Hudson Taylor was a great missionary from the 19th century that served in China. And he wrote, missions is not an option to be considered, but a command to be obeyed. We can't ask the question, should we do missions? The question has to be, how is God calling us to do missions? The question has to be, where is God working that we want to be a part of? And he's calling us uh, to serve with. And why? Verse 10 of the psalm tells us, that all peoples will be judged with equity. Yes, that's Asian and European and African and American, Abbevillian. Is that a word? Do you say Abbevillian? I just made it up. Abbevillian will all be judged 
uh, with that same equity. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there should not be a question of should we be on mission, but how are we to be on mission? And the question shouldn't be should we be on mission tomorrow, but the question should be how should I be on mission tomorrow in the place where God has sent me on Monday morning, just like a trip that I might sign up for in June or July. So missions is a declaration and a command. And the third thing I want us to see is missions is declaration of God's sovereignty. As the psalmist closes in verses 11 to 13, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. To talk about God's sovereignty is to talk about God's control. The God is ultimately in control. As we look at these verses, sovereignty, uh, the trees of the forest singing for joy. Those trees singing remind me uh, of the palm branches that we, we celebrated and waved um, just weeks ago for the triumphal entry of Luke 19. And as Jesus was coming in and the religious leaders told Jesus to rebuke his disciples that were waving the palm branches and praising. Jesus said, if these were quiet, then the stones themselves would cry out. There's a mystery in joining God and what he is doing. He commands us, but he doesn't force us. He gifts us, but he does not need us to fulfill his will. There's an act of surrender to his sovereignty. And there's times that I can't explain that. Yet God will choose to use us when we make ourselves available to him. When I was living in North Africa, we'd have volunteer teams to come over and work with us for a week or two weeks. And there was a team with us. They were from Oklahoma. And we had gone out into a village uh, way outside of uh, the, the town. And there was a small, small town there that had a small hotel. We stayed in the hotel that night, got up the next morning. We were walking to a place where we were going to go eat breakfast uh, that next morning. And as we're walking down the the dusty street, uh, there was a young man walking toward us down the middle of the street coming the opposite way. And he just kept coming right toward us until he got right here in front of me. And uh, and he stopped, and in Arabic, he asked, he said, are you Christians? Well, I had been around enough secret police where I lived before to be careful with that question. And so I said, well, I can only speak for myself, not all the rest of these folks that are with me, but but I'm a believer and and follower of Jesus. And he began to tell me his story. He said that he had listened to a radio program that uh, our company pipes in from an island outside of the country where I live. And on that radio program, he had heard the good news of Christ. And he had prayed and believed. And miraculously, he found himself in an outdoor market called a sook, Um, it's kind of like imagine a super Walmart like four or five times large um, outside and you just walk through and everything you could possibly imagine from live animals to books or food whatever you want to see is there and he was walking through that market and he got to a place where there were tables of thousands of books and the Lord took him to a Bible in a country where Bibles are against the law and he bought that Bible and took it home and he read it and he hid it from his father underneath his mattress and he had been living like that for two years he had never met a Christian And that young man, face to face in the middle of that dusty road, said, until 2 o'clock this morning, when the Lord woke me up and told me if I'd make the three-hour walk to this town, I'd get to meet a Christian for the first time. I can't explain God's sovereignty in that. That doesn't make any sense by human standards. But God has a plan and has control. And little did that young guy know that there was a hidden underground church not too far from him that we were able to connect with and he was able to be baptized. He became a teacher and moved to a a very large city that you know the name of where he continues to worship and proclaim Christ. 
and God's sovereignty, sometimes we get to see the joy of someone coming to know Christ. Sometimes we get to see the joy of a village coming to know Christ. I was on a trip um, just a couple years ago to South Asia. And we went out uh, one morning. A young guy had really wanted this team to go out to this village. The workers that were there didn't think this was going to be worth our time because it was like four hours in a mountain. Uh, it really wasn't a road. Let's say it was a wide enough path to put a vehicle on. And I thought we were going to die the whole time. And we zigzagged our way for hours and hours up into the Himalayans. And we got up in there and um, we never made it to where we were going because we hit some type of a hole and the whole bottom of that uh, four by four dropped down. And I know nothing about cars or I could probably tell you more specific part names. It was bad though. All I know is that we weren't going any further for a long time. We all get out of the four by four. We're looking at our options. No phone service, of course, um, where we were at and thinking through what we were going to do. And so they ended up deciding that uh, two people were going to head off to go get help. The rest of us were going to camp out in that village. And so we found a little place in the village, um, and we went in. There couldn't have been more than like seven, eight houses in this whole village. And um, during the afternoon, an older man, probably in his 80s, came, comes walking through. We called him Uncle G. Uncle G sat down with us, and it's kind of odd to see white people in this odd village hours from civilization. And Uncle G sat down with us, and thankfully we had a translator with us, and we began sharing with him, and uh, we got to where we were sharing the gospel with Uncle G, and uh, Uncle G prayed to receive Christ. And as soon as he finished praying to receive Christ, his first words were, teach me how to share that story with the rest of our village. They might not listen to you, but they'll listen to me. Fast forward months later, the missionary sends us an email and says, not only has the churchman started there and Uncle G's been baptized as well as his family, they're now sending missionaries to other villages uh, around them with the good news. Sometimes I don't understand God's sovereignty. How did that four by four break down at that exact spot uh, in that uh, dusty, mountainous terrain? Uh, but it did. And so as we think about our response, as we think about missions and the foundation for it, we're commanded to pray. We're commanded to pray for workers to go into the harvest. We're commanded to pray for what our role in sharing this good news of Christ is. We're commanded to bring the offering into the temple. And we're commanded to send others when we can't go ourselves. And we're commanded to go to take that good news. The go might be next door. The go might be around the world. We don't have to turn on the news very often to notice that the nations, and they always have, have been coming to us. Maybe because we've had such freedom of religion and we've had such the opportunity that we could have taken the uh, the, the good news to other places more rapidly, God's maybe saying, oh, if you're not going to take the good news other places, I'll bring the nations to you and you can share with them here. We don't have to go very far to find the nations right here in our back door to share the good news of, of Christ. I'll finish with this story. When I first moved down to the desert, now a desert's defined as a place with lack of rain, barrenness, sand and rock, as far as you can see, most of the time, I lived in a small town. And when I first moved there, I was living in out of a hotel until I could find a place to stay. And I learned that people in the desert don't eat dinner until 10, 10 11, sometimes midnight at night, because that's when it's cool enough that people finally come outside. And so people come outside around that time. So since I was living in a hotel, I couldn't use my newfound cooking skills. I had to go find some place that would serve food, restaurant-like. And so I had gone out that night to go find uh, something to eat. And as I was walking down the street, I felt something tapping on the top of my head. Now, people without hair, we notice when things tap on things in our hair more rapidly than other people with hair do, if you don't have hair. And so I noticed tapping, and I was, what is that? I kept sort of looking. Well, it was not, but a few minutes later, so we were having a driving rain right there in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I'd never seen that happen before. And so what do I do? Naturally, we don't have umbrellas in the Sahara Desert. So I quickly got myself over to the side of the street underneath some type of an awning, 
um, that was built not for rain but for sun. And so I get underneath there where I won't get dry. I get, won't get wet and I can stay dry. But I quickly realized that that's not what people that live in the Sahara Desert do when it rains. As I'm over there underneath the awning, people are all coming outside. They're all walking into the middle of the street with their hands out. Little kids have their tongues out to, to feel the water hitting. I see lights coming on in apartment buildings where people are waking up their children to go see the rain. It's like when it snows in South Carolina. Picture that snow, right? We get excited about that. Doesn't happen very often, so therefore you have to take, make the most of it when it does. And so it was raining, and I'm over here doing the American thing underneath the awning, and they're all out in the middle of the street. Cars are honking their horns. It was a party uh, that was getting ready to happen uh, right there in the streets. And as I stood over there watching all this unfold for the first time, I was hit by a thought. I thought, this is what it's going to be like when living water is poured out for the first time on people that live in a dry and barren place on the inside of their life. That's what it was like for me when I didn't know Christ before the living water was poured out for me and for you. And I stood there watching this scene unfold and thought, when the Lord decides to pour living water his truth and his gospel on people who have never heard. I hope that they're celebrating in the streets just like this. And it was a little bit of a picture of Revelation 7, of tribes and tongues celebrating. But then I also thought of something that was much more convicting as I stood there and watched. I thought, when the Lord chooses to pour out that living water, where am I going to be? Am I going to be standing over here where it's nice and safe and dry? Or do I want to be right out there in the middle of what God is doing and celebrate that joy, the joy of working alongside him and allowing him to use me in that way? And that's my prayer for Southside Baptist Church not just an organization, because an organization can't do anything without the members and the people that make it up. And that should be all of our prayer. That tomorrow, when the Lord chooses to pour living water out on the places where we're at, at school, at work, at home, or whether it's down the road and we get to experience that someplace else where God is sending us, where God is using the gifts that we give and God is using prayers that we might never know how they were answered. I was able to teach at a GA camp in Georgia uh, some summers ago. At that time, the country I was living in was expelling foreigners in, in high, high numbers and um, because of fears of them being missionaries and um, people were getting kicked out left and right. And uh, that GA camp, one night, we had all the girls that were there. We were doing these little things, and I had those little girls praying for missionary family that had been told that they were going to get kicked out the next morning, and we prayed. And fast forward a few days later, I get an email back from the missionary who was getting kicked out, and he said, guess what? The police came to my house to tell me that we're not getting kicked out after all. He said, they came at and gave me the time. Well, the time that they came was the exact same moment that those little girls had prayed for them the night before, identical time. I said, that's the power of prayer and the power of faith in those who believe. And that's the type of power of prayer that I know works. Pray for your workers overseas. Pray for your workers in your country. And pray for your church as you seek ways to find where God is working and move alongside him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the new song that you have placed on our lips as we come to know you. We're thankful, Lord, for the command to take that new song and proclaim it to the nations. We're thankful, Lord, that somebody proclaimed it to us and that you allow us and call us to work alongside you in sharing the good news. Here in Abbeville, places where we'll work and go to school tomorrow and places you'll call us to serve you which may be around the world 
that you might be proclaimed. Your love and your grace and the blood that you shed for all will be known. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we stand to sing this morning um, <clears throat> and respond and reflect on this message, um, John 15 says, without me, you can do nothing. That's Jesus talking to us, and that's what this first song is about. I need thee every hour. We need him um, and his power, his strength, his wisdom, his guidance for every, um, every parts of our lives as we, as we seek to do his will. Let's stand together as we sing this morning.
5 says, I will extol you, my God, my King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. That's our prayer this morning, that as we go, wherever we go, we go for the cause of Christ this morning. Let's sing for the cause. For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the sun. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow as many see and many put their trust in the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation god's salvation through the sun For the King once lifted high To cries of rage of crucify Endured the cross as every sin was laid on the sun To the King who conquered death To free the poor and the oppressed For lasting peace for life and liberty in the sun. Christ, we proclaim the name above every name. For all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the sun. Let it be my life's refrain To live as Christ, to die as gain Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun Sing that again Let it be my life's refrain To live as Christ, to die as gain Deny myself Take up my cross and follow the sun. Christ we proclaim. Christ we proclaim. The name above every name. For all creation, every nation. God's salvation through the sun. Christ we proclaim. The name above every name For all creation, every nation God's salvation through the sun Amen, and that is our prayer as we go this morning You are dismissed